Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for inviting me to come today. Um, I should explain, it's quite onerous, or onerous sort of saying that I'm from Milton Keynes Council, and I, and I am from Milton Keynes Council. My background is I'm a, I'm a curator, so I've spent quite a lot, a lot of time uh, working with wonderful artists like Heather and Ivan and others to deliver public realm commissions. So a lot of my work is actually being a sort of midpoint between a local authority and a creative practice. And my job most of the time is to try and sort of help translate ideas into, into a reality uh, while sort of thinking about making sure that various different sort of ideas, names, and objectives are realised. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in, in, in detail, but also making sure that the artists are given the opportunity to do what they want to do. So I um, have been working in Milton Keynes now for about five years, and I arrived in what is a fascinating new town, uh, to, to primarily to deliver public art commissions. And I'm still there, but under a slightly different uh, hat. So just a little bit about Milton Keynes, for those that, that don't know. Um, it's one of the largest of the new towns, the post-war new towns. It has currently a population of 270,000, but it's predicted to grow to half a million by 2050. It's a really fascinating place. You can see from this image, it's obviously the architecture and design is, is completely influenced by modernism. There's nowhere else like it in the UK. It has a really interesting public realm. It's a very contested public realm. It's such a heavily designed space, it's actually very difficult to change it. People love it, people that live there love it, and my goodness, you even want to move a paving slab, there's a lot of consultation that you have to have. We also, it's, it's very interesting in terms of its kind of cultural reputation. I've included the picture of our famous concrete cows. Obviously there was a time, uh, not quite the same now, but sort of in uh, recent history, where Milton Keynes was really derided for not having any culture. It was very kind of common for people to think that new towns, you know, were really devoid of any sort of cultural life. Uh, we, uh, my predecessor commissioned a, a marketing campaign, which went up in lots of different places, which really played on some of those perceptions of Milton Keynes around the lacking in culture of the concrete jungle. It has a very rich culture, but it's just very, very hidden. And again, that's reinforced by the city's design. So I came along uh, to deliver four public art commissions. I then got slightly sidetracked and uh, led on the delivery of the city's bid to become European capital of culture. Now that was called Different by Design. And rather than being about the architecture, it was actually about the six founding utopian principles of Milton Keynes. So it really drew out this idea of equality of opportunity, freedom of choice, and we really kind of developed a bid that was about a sort of celebration of those principles and what they meant for the future. Unfortunately, I don't think we would have won anyway. We were up against some stiff competition, but the competition was cancelled due to Brexit. So we happened to be in a room full of Euro European delegates when uh, we got the message that we obviously the competition couldn't proceed. So we actually went away and thought, well, we've done all this work, and there was a great kind of galvanising of spirit around Different by Design. And so we came up with a plan B, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today, which is a festival of creative urban living. Now, Milton Keynes, like many other cities, has millions of strategies. We have the creative and culture strategy, future vision strategy. One of our strategies included this idea of a festival of creative urban living. And what this was, was to really harness the passion and energy and creativity of our citizens, but also to help define Milton Keynes' cultural USP. So sort of taking the city on a bit of a journey. So we decided, because we couldn't become European Capital of Culture, we would go ahead with a festival of creative urban living. We decided, and sort of we're mid-evaluation at the moment, uh, to try and align it to some other objectives. So I sit in the placemaking team, and my job is to think about what it means for public realm commissioning in relation to successful placemaking. That sounds incredibly boring and dull, but actually it, it can be super interesting. So um, one of the things that we were tasked with thinking about is the regeneration of the centre of the city. Now, I don't know if any of you have been there, but there's a massive shopping centre. It's huge, it's listed, it attracts something like 35 million people a year. It is bucking the trend, it's incredibly successful. 
So this big old monolith sits in the centre of the city. The public realm that surrounds it is completely and utterly failing. Nobody sits in it, nobody uses it, it's, in, it's really run down. We have this lots of issues between kind of moving out of the shopping centre to some of the other city's attractions. You can actually go skiing in the uh, centre of um, Milton Keynes and also skydiving. But there isn't any kind of correlation between the different spaces and the public realm is really failing. So one of our other strategies is called um, Futures 2050 and includes a plan for CNK Renaissance. So we decided to situate our festival right in the centre of this space. So this is Midsummer Boulevard. It takes you from this train station at one end to the gallery at the other, uh, which is where Cave, uh, Heather and Ivan's sculpture is situated. Um, what's super interesting about Midsummer Boulevard, well there's many interesting things, but it's actually built on ley lines. Um, it's also built to align with the summer solstice, so at certain times of the year you can kind of watch the sun sort of set and the moon rise. It's, I mean, it's all very beautiful. But it's, it's a really challenging public realm space. So there was um, some initial thinking. This plan has now been on the table for seven years and nothing was moving. Everybody had lots of different meetings, endless meetings, talking about what we were going to do and what we weren't going to do. So we thought, well, actually, let's just do something. Now, we'll probably talk about this a little bit when we have a discussion, but I think uh, if we'd actually really told most of the departments in the council what we were going to do, we would have never have been allowed to do it. So, but we kind of got it in under the radar and invited a practice called Ramlebo Berlin to come and work with us. Now, the reason that we decided to invite them to come was they had 20 years' experience of working in new towns across the country, across the world, rather. They also have a really interesting approach called show me, don't tell me. So rather than write a strategy, they're actually just come and build their ideas and test it out in real time. So we kind of thought, okay, we'll get them in. They're based in Berlin. There's kind of 15 of them, though they work in different constellations. So these were our overarching objectives. This is how I sold it to my boss. Okay, so it was really about cultural vibrancy. We were going to bring in some different culture to the centre of Milton Keynes. Now, when I got off the train today, I was like, oh, this is so nice. Having a, a city with a university absolutely at its heart is, is brilliant. Milton Keynes doesn't have a university. We're currently trying to get 180 million out of the government to build one, but it's not looking that good. Um, so we don't have that. It has a really uh, limited nighttime economy. Everybody drives out, everybody drives in, and there isn't a lot of kind of reason for nighttime dwell time. So this was an, uh, this was an opportunity to try and sort of think about that. Also thinking about championing our design heritage. I think there's some really interesting design urban planning lessons in Milton Keynes, so it was a bit of owning that. Absolutely the opportunity to talk to our communities about actually if we're going to change the city centre, what would you like to do? And to test out the idea for Midsummer Square. So the idea is, in the grand scheme of things, is to pedestrianise this. Now this is hugely contentious. This is a massive transport hub. Every single bus goes through this space. So we took them out. Uh, we decided to close off this area um, and completely fill it with temporary architectural structures. So these were all designed by Ramlebo Berlin. They kind of ran the sort of whole length of, of Midsummer Boulevard. And this was the central kind of, I guess, iconic piece, Utopia Station. Um, ultimately, a tower that you could go up and down. You had kind of massive views across the city. Um, it was an opportunity, there was a very kind of specific process that you went through uh, where a team of our architects and urban planners that were in residence would basically capture your ideas for what you would like to see. Um, you kind of walked in and you were initially given a cup of tea, this is the team here, this is the ideas kitchen and this is where people asked you to really say, well actually if you were given freedom to sort of transform Central Milton Keynes, what would you do? The ideas then went up the next layer of the tower, and if you kind of got through this very convoluted, sort of weird spinning wheel scenario, if your idea was chosen, they would then make it into a model. And that came down to an exhibition on the ground floor. We had 600 people go through this process in terms of their ideas being selected, and you had everything from like a monorail through to a giant frog sculpture through to you know a portal to Mexico. I mean, it was really far, sort of you know, it was brilliant in many ways, but sort of over and above that, it was an opportunity for us in a really light touch way to introduce the idea that this area is going to change. Uh, we also have the meeting place. So this was, um, again, a temporary structure at one end of Midsummer Boulevard, which was programmed by the community. We did an open call. 
And we had everything from kind of handbell ringing to gospel choirs to Indian food demonstrations to an electronics music workshop to a discussion about cultural diversity to a kind of rock chorus performance. So it was very, very kind of uh, open democratic space. We all had, we also had a very academic theoretical programme about utopian radicalism and, and various kind of European networks came and had a discussion. We had bike school. So Milton Keynes has a completely off-road bike network called the Redways. It was really revolutionary when it was first introduced. Uh, nobody uses it. Not a single soul is on the Redway. They're all in their cars. So we thought, all right, let's get bike school here. We, we again built a temporary pavilion. There was all sorts of different free bike repair, bike ability, BMX workshops. And this was very, very successful. People really uh, got on their bikes, still haven't managed to fix the Redway solution uh, or scenario. But it was just an opportunity to use what is normally a space completely full of buses, stick them full of bicycles. So um, another project, which is kind of a little bit quiet and ancillary to the main architectural pieces, was Beds United. So we went out and gathered 35 hosts from across Milton Keynes. I think Ramblable, Bull, when they came to visit and worked with us over the course of a year, said, well, where the hell is everybody? When you go to Milton Keynes, you don't see them. They're all off out in the grid squares is where, where they live. So they got on their bikes and they said, well, actually, if people come and visit the festival, they're not actually really going to see Milton Keynes. So um, we, we went out and said, OK, residents, come and host somebody. And they, they did. It was lovely. Um, we had guests from all over the UK and Europe. They stayed overnight, they had breakfast, they had dinner, they all got very drunk. Most of the time, they all had terrible hangovers when they came to see us the next day. And they're, they're now currently making a book about Beds United. So it was just an opportunity for people to sort of see a different side of Milton Keynes. So just some facts and figures. I mean, I think, as I said, we're kind of in evaluation at the moment. Um, there was 22 participant audiences, and what we mean by that is actually active participation in the festival's programme. 147,000 passive audiences. So when we, the, uh, we took the buses and the cars out during the weekends, during the week they were there, so you had an absolutely kind of active transport hub around the festival as well. So it was, that was not as a great success, I'd say. Um, 55 free events, four new commissions, 15 partner orgs, Loads and loads of schools and young people were involved. Um, Funding-wise, I mean, this just gives you a sense. It was a kind of, a lot of the funding for this project came from what we call Section 106. So in Milton Keynes, we have a percent for art policy. Whenever there's a new development, uh, we get 1% of the total bill cost comes to our public art budget, which is fantastic, absolutely amazing. We're fighting to keep it. We'll see how long we, we get to, to hang on to it. But it is an amazing opportunity to think about how to work with developers on commissioning public art. And then just sort of some feedback. So I think lessons learned from the festival was that, yes, it was really difficult for a lot of audiences to understand or communicate what it was. It was a really different thing for Milton Keynes. They really had, didn't necessarily have the kind of language or tools to, to sort of understand it. But in, in many ways, that didn't matter. I mean, it, people just kind of engaged with it on lots of different levels. I think it was successful in introducing change to Central Milton Keynes, um, but people really missed their buses. They really were like, where's the buses gone? Bring the buses back. So there, there's lots of challenges around that side of things. I think um, in terms of testing out the viability of Midsummer Square, we got the thumbs up. We're going to go for it. It's going to take about another 15 years, but we will change that part of central Milton Keynes because I think as we move towards delivering Milton Keynes University and various other things that are happening in the city, we absolutely have to think about how to change the public realm and to introduce cultural vibrancy in the sense of actually just giving a people a space to be in the public realm where you don't have to spend any money. I mean, the big thing that came back particularly from young people, was that they're absolutely fed up with the shopping centre. They're fed up of having to spend 15 quid to go and see a film. They want somewhere that's for them, where they don't have to spend a lot of money. And then just very, very quickly, I think, um, I mean, these two projects are, were sort of central to our new creative and cultural strategy. And we're again about sort of repositioning Milton Keynes. So MK Skate rang alongside the festival 
um, and was really an opportunity to tell the story of Milton Keynes as a skateboarding capital. There was a moment in time where it really was the street skate capital of the UK. We had huge amounts of people coming across Europe and America to come and skate Milton Keynes, and again because of the, the architecture and the urban design. So this really was about telling that story. We also, in the uh, early 2000s, commissioned the first ever purpose-built skate plaza, the Buzzy, and it was a really kind of pivotal moment where you saw skate community working hand in hand with the planning teams and the urban planners. So it was a, it was a moment. So there was an exhibition in the shopping centre, which is always a great place to put an exhibition because it's very, very busy. Uh, there was a public realm programme of installations telling the story, und mainly under the underpasses and in the skate plaza, and there will be a publication. And I think in terms of sort of bringing community and giving them a profile and a presence, um, the skaters, they've been with us all the way. It's been a very kind of active and participatory project. Um, and I've learned, I've learned a lot, I didn't know. I've met... Um, Matt Pritchard, the dirty vegan, he came. He used to come and skate um, in Milton Keynes. It was very nice. It was very funny. Um, we also had a whole programme of workshops. So we had uh, you know, skate photography, paint your deck, all different sorts of different ways of, of trying to engage a wider community. And this gives you a sort of sense of some of the underpass installations that went in as well, just to kind of really try and convey the story to people as they were walking through the public space. So that's just some of the projects that we've been working on in Milton Keynes recently. Um, there are many more. We're currently working on sort of four big public art commissions. We're actually the ones that I was supposed to be delivering, so <laughs> we kind of haven't quite got there yet. But um, so I think just to, to give, yeah, just to give it a sort of sense of, of some of the things that we can talk a little bit more. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, um, I've got a question for Fiona. Um, I really loved your presentation. I grew up in Milton Keynes, oh. and I'm also a planning nerd, so oh. it was really exciting to, to see someone from the kind of council harking back to the really radical kind of foundational principles of Milton Keynes, but also kind of the sort of radical policy ideas. And um, I think often when you know people that aren't from Milton Keynes talk about Milton Keynes, it's, a, it's kind of considered a bit of a national joke. But actually, it was kind of such an ambitious project, and actually, the kind of founding principles behind it were kind of really nothing has nothing as ambitious as has been kind of built on this scale before or since. Um, and I just kind of, and I also think you know, in terms of like new towns, it takes time for kind of culture to evolve. So, um, yeah, what I, what the question I want to ask is about uh, legacy, I suppose, because I think you know it. It, you get bringing in Ramble, Ramblebore and having these kind of this really exciting festival, I think you know, obviously is a big kind of instigator for new ideas. But how do you see these kind of these sort of events or these sort of uh, projects, you know, feeding back into kind of the sort of wider policy around planning for culture in cities? That's a, a, a really good question, and I think uh, one of the well, there's two things really. I mean, we've recently moved, so now we sit within place making we um, are, have an opportunity to really work very closely with the urban planning team. So that, m that many local authorities don't have those anymore, we, we still do have one. I think you're absolutely right. We were very ambitious and perhaps a little sort of naive to think, oh, we'll do the festival and that's going to solve everything. Mm -hmm. that's, that's absolutely not the case. What it has done, though, is provide a really strong evidence base. Yeah. And that evidence base has kind of... Um, this sounds very dry, but there's a there's a very robust report which will go to cabinet and you know councillors and so on and so forth, so they can see actually this is what the citizens want. The festival really was a vehicle of communication as much as anything, because I think what happens is within local authorities you you sometimes get so far removed from your citizens you don't really you'll get a bit scared of them. You know, we, are, we have this thing where you, you, of course, we're accountable. We're there, we're there paying taxpayers' money. We're there to deliver certain civic objectives. But I think, um, ultimately, when you do projects like this, and if you can capture the information and the feedback in the right way, you then can influence. So I think we are fortunate. The culture team now sits on an, enough of a level to have an influence. We're not in charge, unfortunately, not yet. But um, we, we do, our, our opinion is listened to. Uh, but that's taken a long time, um, and I think it, it just really depends. And of course, it's a very hierarchical environment. But I think you're right. New towns, it does take a long time, or has taken some time, sort of, for that cultural offer 
and the importance of culture to be recognised. But I think that it's, it's getting there. Good. I wish you good luck. Thank you. <laughs>